After talking about variables and constants for a while, it's a good time that we start talking about ownership and Rust. Now, ownership is what, in at least in my opinion, confuses a lot of developers that are coming to Rust. It's, it is a complicated topic, to be honest with you. Even I sometimes have to think, like when I'm writing complicated code or like big pieces of code, I have to think about how variables are moving between pieces of functions and they're going from different blocks to different blocks and how ownership affects that. So there are some rules to how ownership works actually in Rust. And I think it's very important that we spend some time in this part of uh, the course to talk about ownership and moving of values from block to block. So. Now, we're going to have a look first at an example uh, that I think is like the prime example of how Rust works when it comes to ownership and moving values. And for those of you who are new to Rust, this might actually be kind of like shocking uh, that it, because the code that we're going to write works completely fine in other languages like JavaScript, TypeScript, Dart, Swift, you name it, pretty much anywhere in Python. <laughs> it's just that in Rust, this piece of code won't work. And uh, this is like, a, I think, is the pillar uh, example of what we need to look at uh, in, this, in this section of the video and why it works the way it works in Rust, or rather why it doesn't work in Rust the way it should work. So let's have a look at an example. I'm going to bring up uh, my uh, actual example that we're going to do. So let's just say, let's name one. And let's just say string from, OK? And let's say John in here. And then I'm going to say name two. I'm going to assign the value of name one, or at least what we think is the value of name one into name two, OK? After that, we're going to go ahead and print both these values. So let's say print ln name one, actually, let's put some hello in here, hello, name one, and then hello, name two as well. And then try to compile this application. See, we're now getting a compile time error in our applications. This is not like a runtime error. This is not a warning. This is an actual compile time error. So our application is not even compiling. And you can see it's, it says a borrow of move value name one, uh, value barred here after move. So. There are two things to understand about this piece of code that is happening and that, that is written in here. There are two things that are happening. One is borrowing and another one is moving. These two are the pillars of memory management in Rust, borrowing and moving. So you can see in here um, what is happening inside the println function. If you look at its, um, its signature, I mean, how can I say this is not so easy to understand even if I, even if I want to explain it, but the important thing to understand in print LN, LN uh, macro is that it is doing something called borrowing. What borrowing does in Rust is that it, as its name indicates, is like taking a variable and it's not affecting its memory. It's not, it's not going to mutate that variable at all. It's just going to access it, a read only access that is borrowing. However, what we've done in here, name two, is that we are, have actually moved that variable. So name two causes name one on, on its stack space and its heap space to be allocated to name two. So name two from this point on, from line five and onwards, is going to own name one. So name one, you could pretty much say name one is pretty much dead because you can't, you can't really do so much with it. So keep these things in mind. Uh, so we have borrowing and also we have moving. And we're going to go through these things in this uh, section of the video. So uh, what we're going to do then is going to have a look at uh, uh, some examples in this section and see why it happens the way it happens in Rust and why it doesn't work the way it, you think it should work in Rust. And as I said, this is something quite theoretic so that you have to look at a theory a lot for why the Rust compiler engineers have made their decisions to do the implementation like they've done. And also you need to put yourself in the shoes of how they thought about memory management in order to completely grasp the implementation that we are uh, as end users actually using. Okay. So let's go ahead and create an example in here. If we go ahead and just create a block of code inside the main function, and, and I say name is John to string, okay? So we actually create a string, and then let's print ln this. So we say hello, and then we say John or name, 
Okay. And so this, this code should work without a problem. And then if I bring up the terminal, you can see hello John is printed here. Maybe you actually don't see it because it's blocked by the label. I think you see hello John is printed in here. Okay, so no problem at all. However, if you go outside this blog and then try to access name, you can see there is no name available in here. We're gonna get a compile time error. And the reason behind this is that name is a variable that is defined, <clears throat> excuse me, in that particular block of code. So what Rust does is that it looks at any, any block of code, any scope of code, and looks at the variables that are created inside that, that scope. When, those, when that block goes out of scope, so at, at line eight in here, that block is completely meaningless to Rust logically. So it says, okay, you created a block, you created some variables in here, and I'm actually gonna allocate some heap space for this variable. Don't worry about it. We're going to talk about heap space and stack space uh, soon. So it's allocated some memory and put the ver uh, put the value of John in that memory space. And at line six and a half, meaning this line between six and seven, so six and a half, right after line six is done, Rust understands that this block of code is now out of scope. So it's going to deallocate the memory allocated to the name variable. So meaning that name is going to go out of scope. And that is the reason you don't have access to name after line seven, meaning line eight in this case. So that you need to keep that in mind. So Rust tries to manage the memory of uh, that it has allocated for your variables automatically. So you don't have to do any kind of like garbage collection uh, like that. So there's no runtime that is, for instance, kicking in at runtime and like cleaning up your uh, your garbage, uh, basically doing garbage collection for you. It's actually happening at, at compile time. So in order to understand all of this as well, like where memory is allocated, why some var variables can be moved without, uh, without, um, without problem. Because like if I do the same code in here and I say age one is 10 and I say let age two is 10 and I try to do the exact same code from before and I say you are years old and I say H1, and then I say the same thing for H2. This code is gonna work without a problem. So this compilation is actually working, and you can see I can go to the terminal, and you can see 10 years old and 10 years old. Maybe we should actually, sorry, this should be H2, should be H1. So uh, you can see this code works fine. So there is no compilation error in the, in the case of an integer. So, but if you change the same code to work with strings, then all of a sudden the same code doesn't work. So. In order to understand that, we need to talk about stack versus heap. And that is a very important topic that I think every software engineer needs to know about, especially if you're working with programming languages such as Rust. So let's talk about what stack is and what heap is. You are probably already familiar with like a basic stack implementation at a high level. Like you have, um, usually when you're learning a programming language such as Rust or Dart or JavaScript or Swift or whatever it is, you can write a class, for instance, or a structure in Swift that uh, you can push values into and pull values out of. So that is like last in, first out, LIFO, I think. Um, so when you push a value into a stack, uh, you can, it basically goes here and then you push another value. You're basically pushing the first value down and then you push another value, push another value. So by, by pushing, you're pushing on top of the stack of values that you have. And then the access on a stack happens by popping. So you say pop a value. By popping a value from the stack, you're popping the last value pushed, and then all the other values that were pushed before that last value are gonna pop a little bit higher, one step higher, kind of, okay? So that is for stack. So stacks like last, uh, last in, first out, okay? Uh, and every function you can say in, um, every function that you write, even if you look at the assembly level, you have some stack space. So your, your program has some memory available in its stack, and then you can, you can use it. And every function can have its own space available as its own stack space, okay? Now that's stack, so you can, every function has its own memory and like every thread can have its own memory uh, and they're kind of like separated from each other. And if you're looking at the assembly level, you can do some dirty, really dirty stuff like, X access another function stack. It, 
when you're coming come to that level you can do really bad stuff but in most modern programming languages they don't really let you work with stack at that low a level okay so that's for stack now when we get to the heap then we have um then we have another dimension so heap space it's kind of like a memory space as a continuous uh, piece of memory space that you ask the operating system you say hey operating system can i have some space available like uh, a megabyte of space and the operating system uh, allocates that uh, space to you and then provides you with an address to that space and then your program can basically store information into that space and then wipe that space and relinquish that space back to the operating system so heap uh, and a heap is kind of like random access so you can just put stuff in the heap wherever you want to pretty much so it's not really like the stack so heap is kind of like the wild wild west and stack is kind of like the modern west <laughs> i don't know how to call it but you, you get the idea so in order to understand the rest of this chapter you kind of need to understand what stack and heap are and to be honest with you i give you a very simplistic view of what stack and heap are if you want to you can pause this video right now and go ahead and read about stack and heap and i would suggest that you have a look at a very technical detailed version uh, of the explanation for heap and stack because that's really the only way you're going to understand how these things actually work and you need to know a little bit about operating systems how they work and also how the assembly language works and how basically computers work for that matter okay but if you want to pause this video go ahead please and do that before continuing with the video now what a uh, i showed you this example of an integer and then we also had a look at a string and we saw that integers work differently and they this same example if we change this to work with strings it just doesn't compile so the reason behind that is that a string object as we saw like we said string from or like john to string it is a value in rust that is stored both on the stack and also uh, the heap so uh, before i go more into uh, into the details about it let's just let's just uh, have a look at the, what i've written at the bottom of the screen that a, a string has three pieces of data one is it the pointer to uh, the heap where the actual string is allocated. So, uh, and this string structure that I'm talking about right now that I say, oh, it has a pointer, this itself is stored in the stack. So imagine that your string has a, a storage of three pieces of very important information. One is this pointer. That pointer points to a variable in the heap which is the string var variable itself, its contents. The other one is its length, and the other piece of information is its capacity, okay? So let's have a look at the illustration, which I think the Rust compiler team has put together very nicely. Have a look at that, okay? So you can see here, we have a string called S1, and this S1, uh, you can see um, it has a pointer. So this piece of information, all it does is it points to a value in the heap. So the string contents in this case hello are stored somewhere in the heap and that somewhere's address is stored here in the stack as the first piece of information under the pointer um, data structure okay or data then we have the length of that uh, data so because you can have pointer anywhere in the heap but you need to also know how long that information is otherwise you're just going to read data for as long as you want to in the heap on, uh, until until you basically get a crash or something so the length of this particular string which is hello is five so you have a start point and basically you can calculate your end point by looking at the length okay and also then you have a capacity in here so the capacity meaning that uh, in here capacity being five meaning that you're not allowed to change the contents of the string over that capacity because maybe there's another value maybe there's another string stored right after this hello string in the heap okay so by going over the capacity you're running the risk of actually rewriting the value of the other variable as well and that's something that you don't want to do okay so the left hand side is stored in the stack and the right hand side is stored in the heap okay usually that's how it's work how, how it works okay so now if we go back to the example that we have with the name that we said name one is equal to actually let's go back to it Let's rewrite it in here and go back.
back a little bit here. So we had name one and stored as John in here. And then we have name two equal to name one. Now let's have an example. Uh, now let's have a look at what, what actually happened in this case, uh, kind of similar to the diagram that we just saw, saw uh, with the graphic that we saw from Russ's uh, compiler team that have put together how name one is actually stored in the stack and the heap. But in this case, we're going to have a look at what actually happens in the case of moving name one into name two. Okay. So let's go to that uh, diagram in here. So uh, you can see in here S1 and S2. Let me actually rename these things. So I'm going to say S1 and I'm going to say S2 in here. So we kind of get a better understanding. So S1 in here is a, is a string that says John. And in here it says hello. So let's just change that to hello as well. So it's exactly the same thing as in the diagram. Okay. We have S1 that says hello. And you can see in here what happened is that S1, uh, again, the same structure with the pointer length and capacity. It, it's in the stack and it is pointing to a variable in the heap. So it says index and uh, value. So this is nothing special. Then we have S2 that then is pointing to the same uh, variable uh, in the heap, the same data in the heap, which has to be deallocated at some point, okay? So uh, it has to be deallocated at some point, but they're pointing to the same variable. It is the exact same place in the heap. Now you have two variables basically um, pointing to the same heap data. And remember, when variables go out of scope, when variables that are like this, that are both in the stack and the heap, the heap memory will automatically be deallocated by Rust. So in this case, the S1 string and S2 string go out of scope when the main function is finished, okay? So what happens in here? S1 points to this structure in here and in the stack and in the heap. So when the main function is done, Rust looks at S1 and says, oh, this is pointing to something in the heap and heap memory has to be manually deallocated. So it goes ahead and deallocates this, it says, okay, I'm done. Then it gets to S2 and says, oh, S2 points to the same thing in the heap. Then when the main function is done, Rust is going to go ahead and deallocate the same pointer again. And then you're going to get double deallocations in here. So this usually ends up with a crash because the operating system is going to tell you, well, you don't even have access to this memory anymore, but because you've deallocated it already, this is how usually memory management works with operating systems. So operating system is not going to be just sitting there and say, oh, you deallocated this twice. This is fine. So uh, it kind of like reminds me of that. This is fine meme. So this is not going to work. So you can't have two variables pointing to the same data in the heap. And this is exactly what is happening by doing this kind of operation. You say, here is a heap value, and this is also the same heap value. Then what is happening in here is this borrow of move value. So it says you can't use S1 anymore. It is moved, okay? So this is a very important thing to understand. So as I, as I mentioned here, this concept is, is called moving. And... Um, we basically say name one is moved into name two, meaning that it has a new home, basically. So after that point on, name one is kind of, or S1 in this case, is kind of useless. It's been moved. It's, it has a new home. It's called S2, okay? So this is, I understand this may be a little bit like a mind joggling uh, that you're thinking like, but why is this? I mean, if you're if you're thinking why is this happening, let's just go back to that example that I mentioned here because is because Rust has automatic memory deallocation and it can't double deallocate a heap space. Okay, so pause the video, think about that. It, it is completely logical and it all comes down to Rust making the decision of deallocating memory the way it does. Uh, by putting instructions in your code at compile time rather than having garbage collection like some other languages such as Java, for instance, okay? So there is no garbage collection in that sense in Rust, okay? Now, moving, uh, moving happens uh, in Rust uh, using a trait uh, called copy. Now, this, is, this sounds a little bit alien, I completely understand. We haven't talked about traits yet. But think about that um, traits are kind of like 
how do, how do I call it? It's kind of like a mixin in Dart or a protocol in Swift or kind of like an interface in other languages, okay? So a when you create a string by defaulting here, uh, it already conforms to that particular trait called copy. And when you assign S1 into S2, Rust is under the hood uh, going ahead and kind of like copying the contents of that and bringing it into another variable uh, and kind of like moving it for you. Basically, this process is called moving as it is done using traits. I just want to bring up traits because it is very relevant, but I don't want us to get hooked up into what is a trait? How does that work? Because we're going to talk about traits. Yeah, quite a lot later, actually, not right now. Okay. Just know that there is thought process behind it and it's being done using some functions. All right. So <clears throat> I mentioned the example of integers and we had a look at like uh, age one and age two. And you saw that by assigning age one into age two, uh, the same error didn't pop up. And I mentioned that that is because age one and age two are kind of stored in the stack. Okay. So, um, so what happens is that stack values uh, are copied by default, meaning that if I create, for instance, let's go back to age one and age two, age one, age one is 10. And then we say, let age two is 20. Uh, sorry, not 20. I say age one. And then we print them, print and then you are uh, years old. Okay. Let's see if it can complete it for us. So I don't have to type all of this uh, H2. Okay. So this works completely fine simply because H1 and H2, are, they're both integers. So what happens in here is that um, by creating H1 as 10 and assigning H1 into H2, Rust is actually creating a completely new copy of this 10 integer uh, or, the, or the integer of 10 into H2. So is not like borrowing or is not like moving H1 into H2. Instead, it's looking at the value of H1 and say, oh, it's the value of 10. It's in the stack. I'm going to make a new copy of that and bring it into H2. So they work in different ways, simply. So because the value of H1 is an integer, or in this case, I32, a 32-bit integer stored in the stack, not the heap, there's no moving happening in here, okay? So that move is only constrained to uh, uh, values that are in the stack and the heap, okay? Or at least what, what we've seen so far is that. So just know that uh, this integer works in a different way simply because it's stored in the stack and not the heap, and this value is being copied into H2. So a new clone of that is happening pretty much, okay? Okay. So now that we've looked at that and we looked at this S1 and S2 and we're like, okay, so this is, let's actually go back to S1 and S2. So we saw that this doesn't work, but this is a very valid scenario. Like you may actually want to do this in your program. You'd be like, okay, I have a new variable. I actually want to store S1 into that variable as well. So how do I go about doing this? Now, there's a concept in uh, Rust and it is called references. References are read-only uh, view of another variable. So as its name indicates, is a reference is not the exact same variable. Uh, it does have a pointer to that variable, but that is pretty much it. It just has a pointer. Okay, so it's it's not allowed to like do any anything else really with that variable. So references are written with an ampersand, and an ampersand you just put it behind your uh, variable and then you create a reference out of it. So let's do that, put a reference in here, and you can see all of a sudden the S2 variable became a, a reference to another string. And then your program compiles, and I can bring up the, the, the terminal in here, and you can see we're, we're seeing hello, hello. Or maybe we should put John in here. John, and you can see hello, John, and hello, John being printed to the screen, OK? We're going to talk more about that. Don't worry about it. So references point to valid data. Let's have a look at the diagram for references. And I think it is this one. <clears throat> okay. So you can see in here, uh, S1, uh, for instance, is your first string. So if you go in here, S1, 
that has all the structure. It has like the uh, pointer, it has the length and the capacity as it had before. But all of a sudden you have this S in here. Let's change this name to S perhaps. Was it a capital S as well? That was not a good name. Uh, but anyways, but when you create a new S in here, which is a string pointer, or maybe I shouldn't call it a pointer, it's actually a reference. What this does, it has a pointer to the structure that actually stores the information for the value, which is eventually in the heap. So <laughs> don't think that this pointer is pointing to the value in the heap, but it's actually pointing to the to the same string structure in the stack, which then points to the value in the heap. So it is a little bit complicated. I completely understand it, but just understand for now that when you're creating a reference like this, without any special like keyword like this, you're creating a read-only view or a reference as its name indicates to another variable. And that variable could be in the stack or it could be in the stack and the heap, okay? In this case, we're referencing a value of type string, meaning that we already know string is both in the stack and the heap. So we have a string reference uh, and our reference sits actually in the stack. So references sit in the stack. So this structure in here sits in the stack. This structure that we point to sits in the stack, but the pointer of this structure itself points to a value in the heap. Okay, so stack, stack, heap. Okay, so you can look in here. Our S is in the stack. S1's structure is in the stack with the pointer length and capacity. However, its data is in the heap, okay? And again, look, I'm sorry, but I understand it, it could be quite complicated. But if you if you get stuck here, if you feel like this is too much, don't worry about it. You practice, you just need to practice more. You need to understand what stack and heap are. So one thing that could stop a lot of developers from understanding Rust is actually they don't want to learn what stack is and what heap is. And I don't know how to explain that so well. I just want to tell you that I think, in my opinion at least, that the best way to learn about the stack and the heap is actually to learn assembly. And I don't mean that you actually go ahead and completely learn assembly. I just mean that look at some assembly code at least that explains heaps and stacks. You will understand that it is very, very easy to understand, for instance, what stack is, because in assembly you actually have instructions that work with uh, uh, with stacks. So you have push and you have pop and you have registers that you can store uh, values for your variables in, in the stack. So you have the stack pointer, you have the base pointer. So in my opinion, look at some assembly code to learn what stack is. Once you've learned stack, you don't have to, um, sorry, once you've learned stack with assembly, you don't have to learn heap with assembly because actually that is quite complicated. And heap Allocation, I think, is best learned if you look at a language such as C. I think this is pretty good because, like, the Linux kernel is written in C, and you can also have a look at some examples that explain heap allocation in uh, Linux using the C programming language. So that's my uh, opinion, at least. Okay. So when we look at references, uh, references, what's different? What's different from them is that by the end of this main function, so at line nine in here, when main is out of scope and S one and S actually go out of scope, references don't drop their value. So S one, when it goes out of scope, it's just out of scope. That's it, because it was a variable in the stack. That by the end of this function's execution, the stack pointer pops back to where it was by the caller to this function. So S just goes out of scope, no deallocation re required. However, when it gets to S1, S1 is still a variable that is both in the stack and the heap. So S1's going out of scope causes S1's value to also be deallocated from, uh, from the heap, okay? So references are kind of harmless. It's kind of like a, in this case, this is a read-only reference to another variable that is both in the stack and the heap in this case, okay? So uh, let's have a look at references and how, how they work. So we're going to have a, a look at writing a function that can print the contents of a string. So we, we have already print ln, but let's go ahead and say we have a function in here. Let's say fn, we create a new function, okay? We say greet, and then we say name is a pointer to a string, 
Okay, and then we say hello name. Actually, I like this suggestion by GitHub Copilot, so this this is fine. Okay, that is great. Then we have S1 in here. So let's actually leave S1 and S in here. I'm, I'm just gonna call this guy S2, all right? So a simple function I call greets and two variables. One is a string in stack and heap, and the other one is just a string reference. There's a pointer to S1, okay? Like, I'm kind of, kind of cautious with using the word pointer because it could, it could wake some thoughts uh, from like the good old days of using C and C++ and some other languages that have pointers. But this is not really uh, the Rust's uh, string reference or sorry, Rust's references aren't really like pointers. They're quite different actually. So, and we'll see more examples of why they're different. But for now, just let's just keep calling them references actually not pointers, okay? So, okay, I'm just, I'm just gonna say greets then, well, greets in here. And then I'm going to say S1, and this is not going to work, and you'll see why. And it says in here, because uh, this function is expecting a string reference, but we're passing a string to it. So the way to fix that is just to put a, a an ampersand, and then we say S1. Okay, and then we can also say greet S2. But for S2, we don't have to put an ampersand because it's, it, it already is a string reference, okay? And if we bring the uh, terminal, you can see it says, hello, John, in both cases. So I can save to a fresh compilation. You can see it says, hello, John, all right? So this was a simple uh, simple uh, function example of how it works. And usually you see functions like this uh, and you don't see them written like this. And if you don't see them written like this, then you know the reason behind it. And the reason is that if this function was written like this, you can see that we're going to get a lot of errors, actually. Let's, let's just remove this one. Now we're all of them saying, getting a, an error, saying, um, let's point to it. Oh, yeah, you see now we're getting cannot move out of. But you, what's happening in here is that by doing this kind of work in here, you're telling the compiler that any string passed in here needs to be moved to this function. So this function needs to take uh, ownership of this string. So once this function is done, this string needs to be dropped. But this is usually not what you want to do. You want to borrow. You want to basically get a reference to a string and do your work with that string and then be done with it pretty much. Okay. So we'll go in here and put the ampersand. Now our program works as expected. Okay. Now references we've seen in here, like this is a reference to a string. References can be mutable and immutable. All right. So uh, we're going to have a look at an example, but just know that in this case, this is an immutable string reference because nothing in here states that this string is going to be changed. We're basically saying that we're borrowing a string as a read-only copy, okay? But you can also create like a reference that is mutable as well, all right? So let's go ahead and create a function in here. We're going to call it clear or something, empty string. I can see empty string. Okay, empty string. And then we're going to, in this function, we're going to take in a, a string reference. And our, our job in this function is to clear the contents of that string. So someone passes a string such as John, and then we're going to clear the contents of that John string. Um, so by the end of this function, the callers, if the caller uses that string, they're just going to see an empty string. Okay, so let's take the uh, string in here and we're going to say value is for now ampersand string like this. And then we're going to say value, value dot clear. You can see in here, okay, we're going to get some completion errors. So don't worry about it. Uh, okay, and the reason this is happening is that um, you are telling the compiler that you want to mutate or change the contents of this borrowed value. So you're borrowing a string like this one, this S1. You're borrowing it in this function. You're not actually saying that give it to me. You're saying, let me borrow it for some time until I'm done. You're borrowing it, but then you're telling the compiler that you want to basically modify it. And this is kind of like in real life. You wouldn't borrow like your uh, your neighbor's car and then just go take it to uh, MTV's Pimp My Ride or something and like they completely change it. So you take a car from your neighbor and then you can write it and you return it exactly the way you left it. That's that's like the code. 
So the same is happening here in Rust. You're telling Rust that, hey, I want to borrow this string, but all of a sudden inside this function, you're saying, oh, I'm, I'm modifying it, I'm mutating it. And this is, and you can see also it says in here, so it cannot borrow as mutable as it is behind a ampersand reference. Value is an ampersand reference so that the data it refers to cannot be borrowed. I mean, it, it, it can't be more detailed than this. So um, you can't mutate, you cannot change if it change a reference to a value that you borrowed. Okay, so this is this is one of the rules in Rust. Now, what you can do though is to change your reference to a mutable reference. So let's go in here and put the value mut in here or the keyword mut. So all of a sudden you can see your function compiles. We're getting a warning in here simply because we are not using this function. So what is happening in here? Maybe you're thinking that, oh, but I thought this is read-only copy. But there is a difference between ampersand and mut in here. So what's happening in here is that in by doing an ampersand, you're creating a reference. Okay, so you're not asking the Rust compiler to move the contents of a variable into your function. You're just getting a reference to it. By putting a, an ampersand mut, you're getting a mutable reference. You get the point? You're not actually moving the contents into the function and then making a mutable. You're saying that there is some string somewhere in this stack and in the heap. Give me a read-only copy. So this is like, give me a read-only copy of a pointer to that variable, pretty much like this. So this, this will be inside your function in here. Okay, you're getting a read-only copy to it. And then if you put mut in here, you're saying, oh, I don't want to read only. Sorry, did I say read-only copy? That's not good. Uh, give me a read-only reference to it. But then when you say ampersand mut, you're saying, give me a reference whose contents I can actually change as well. All right, so all of a sudden you're going from a reference to a mutable reference, and this is how you would do it in Rust, okay? So let's go ahead then and create a mutable variable in uh, our main function. So I'm going to remove these from here, and let's call this name, okay? And then after creating that name, let's go and pass that name into the function so that this function can clear the contents of this variable for us. So we're going to say empty string, okay? And then this is the syntax that you have to use. So you're not just passing the reference anymore, but at the call site, you also have to tell Rust that I don't just want to pass a read-only reference, but I actually want to pass a mutable reference to my variable, okay? So your variable at this point is not going to be moved into the function. You're just giving the function the ability to change it. There's two different things. And so giving a function a mutable reference to your car is like giving your, uh, sorry, a mutable reference to a variable is like giving your car and lending it to your, uh, to your neighbor and saying, here's a car, you have it for like a week or how long you need it, and you're allowed to change this car. Like you're allowed to, for instance, change its color, you're allowed to like do the repaint job, you're allowed to clean it if you want to, you're allowed to do this and that or change the tires. That's a mutable reference, okay? However, if you hadn't done this and you actually pass your string in here like this, okay? If you pass your string in here and moved it, that is kind of like telling your neighbor, here's my car, take it, okay? So it's two completely different things. Giving a mutable reference to a variable is completely different from actually moving a, a variable, okay? So that's why uh, that's why these two pieces of code are completely different and they're writ written in completely different ways as well, okay? Right, name, mutable string, cannot bar name, mot name, let's string. This looks fine to me at, at this point at least, but let's actually uh, uh, fix this code as well and see what's happening in here. So we have a mutable reference to a string here, clearing it, and then and let's go ahead and says cannot borrow name as mutable and it is not declared as mutable. So let's go ahead and change this as well. Let not. So what happened, what was happening here is that um, we were actually passing a mutable, re mutable reference to our variable to this function. However, this variable itself was not declared as mutable, meaning that the contents of this variable were not marked as being able to get changed. Okay, so this is what we have to do in here. Okay, now, 
There is a restriction though in mutable references, and that is that you can have at most one mutable reference, uh, as you can see at the bottom of the screen, uh, to a variable. So um, let's let's actually have a look at an example instead of me having to just uh, babble on. So let's say let um, name let name two is a mutable reference to name. And then we say let's name three is also a mutable reference to name like this. Okay, good stuff. Now we have two mutable references and uh, we're then gonna go ahead and call that function then. All right, so let's say uh, clear, what, what, was, what do we call it? Empty string, we call it empty string. And then I'm gonna pass the mutable name in here and, and you're gonna now uh, basically start seeing the problem it's actually name three. Okay. So you can see in here, we're getting an error and cannot borrow name three as mutable. Let's pass this, sorry, let's make these mute, mute, and then actually put name in here. So, and then we're going to say name two, and you can see we're getting an error in here. So what's happening is that you cannot have more than one uh, mutable reference to a variable in Rust. And this is really just to, I mean, let me bring up the uh, label for it. This is to prevent something called data races. And a data race happens in computer programming in general. It, it doesn't necessarily just have to, hap have to happen in Rust, but it also can ha happen, for instance, in uh, Python or in Swift. It happens when you have at least one variable that writes to a place in memory and one or more places that read that content. So. It could easily happen that uh, basically your data is um, is out of, out of date. It's kind of like you end up with a stale piece of data that you read from the memory because some, someone else is writing at the same time to that place in memory. Okay, so you cannot just for now know that you cannot have more than one mutable reference to a, a variable in Rust. I'm not going to go too much into details about this because this is actually one of the more like advanced pieces of um, uh, memory management in Rust, but I can show you more examples of this as we go on in, throughout the chapters, okay? So um, so there another, another restriction that we need to talk about is that uh, you cannot have mutable references while immutable references are there. So uh, let's go ahead and see if we can actually have a look at this. So let's say, let's name one is a string from John. And uh, let's create, let's make this immutable, okay? And let's say, let's uh, name two, and we, we call this uh, name one, okay? We bar it, and then we say, let's name three is, we, can, we make it mutable, and we say, this is a mutable reference to name one, okay? And if we then print ln, and we say, name one, name two and name three in here, okay? This is this is the restriction I was talking about. So you can see it says cannot borrow name one as mutable because it is also borrowed as immutable. So one here. So name two is an immutable reference to name one, right? But all of a sudden name three is becoming a mutable reference to name one, meaning that you have a variable that is very happy just sitting in the stack saying that, ah, I want to refer to some variable called name one. And then name three is going and say, oh, I want to refer to the same variable, but I actually want to change it. So you cannot have, this is, this is another rule, you cannot have a variable that wants to have a mutable reference to another mutable variable, but you have an immutable reference to the same variable. So this all has to do with memory management and I don't want to go too much into it. I just want to introduce you to the rules that are happening in, in Rust. But there are very good reasons behind it. But at the end of the day, it all comes to memory management. It all comes down to like preventing data races. It comes down to preventing double deallocations. Good reasons behind it. However, I completely understand that even good reasons could get quite complicated. So let's not go too much into details about it. I, as I mentioned, I just want to introduce you to some of these rules, OK? So uh, that also uh, 
as you can see, it cannot mute it while immutable references is there. So this also includes name one in here. So name one basically at the moment you can't you can't really immutably use it either because you have like mutable and immutable references to it, but it's all connected to the same same thing basically. So um, the scope of variables in Rust is very, very important. Um, all you need to know is that variables that are in the heap and you have references to them uh, in, in the stack, such as a string, um, they need to be deallocated. And this deallocation happens at compile time. I don't mean that they're it, like Rust is sitting here and like literally waiting for me to do work so that it can deallocate stuff. But Rust looks at the code that we write and then says, okay, by the end of this main function, I have to deallocate this and this and this. So you need to look at how Rust basically thinks and there's really good documentation about it also on the on the on Rust's website uh, in the book as it's called about memory and allocation and references borrowing and moving, which I suggest that you read before continue with the rest of uh, this uh, course. But my point is, uh, and my goal is to introduce these things to you one step at a time without without like over um, being uh, like in an overwhelming way. I didn't go into too much details about like these rules in this chapter. I just want to introduce you to them. So I, I expect that you go ahead and like play with these things and also read the Rust book on um, memory management and ownership. I think there is a specific chapter about ownership. So I highly suggest that you have a look at that document alongside this course as well. Okay. So uh, there's one more thing that I wanted to talk about in this in this section of, of the course, and that is dangling references. And a this may be a term that you're familiar with if you're, for instance, coming from C++. Um, even assembly, you could have dangling references, actually. But uh, let me just show you an example, which I think is going to help quite a lot in understanding dangling references in Rust. So let's clear these two functions up, remove them from here, OK? so. Let's go ahead and return a function that, for instance, returns a, uh, sorry, create a function that returns a name, but uh, it returns it not as a string, but actually a reference to a string. So let's let's say get name, and it returns a reference to a string. And in here, we're just going to say uh, John to the string. Okay, so, so let's go in here and do it like this. Great stuff. Now. Um, we're getting actually a lifetime. Yeah, this is this is very interesting. So, um, so what happened? What is happening in here? You can see that we can't actually return a string reference to uh, to a caller in here. Rust is getting confused, saying, "Okay, wait a minute. You're giving me an object that is both in the stack and the heap, but then at the end of this function, you're actually returning that object to the caller. So if I go in here and I say let's uh, name is get name, okay? So you're saying all of a sudden that string that you create inside this function has to live past the lifetime of this function. That is why you're getting this error in here talking about the lifetime uh, specifier. We haven't talked about lifetime specifiers in Rust yet, but all you need to know is that Rust is kind of like, wait a minute, I'm kind of confused in here. You're create, are you creating a string in here? In that case, how is that string going to live past the lifetime of the function in which you created it? So this is kind of like an internal dialogue Rust has with itself saying, no, but this doesn't make any sense. <laughs> so this is this is like a this is kind of like a dang reference kind of. So you you can't I mean, with, with, there, are, there are ways of doing this, doing this correctly. But just know that at this point, you can't really do it the way you think you're Going to be able to do it in other languages. In, in some other languages, you can just return a string from a function and that works. Okay, so um, you can change this, for instance, to a string, and uh, and then change this reference as well, and everything works. But what if you want to return a reference to a string? There are things called string slices in Rust, and we're going to talk about them uh, in coming chapters. But for now, just know that there's actually uh, there are some rules you need to follow when it comes to uh, memory management in Rust, and I and I really hope that that this chapter uh, awoke some thoughts in you in how Rust thinks uh, in 
in terms of memory management. So if you take something away from this chapter, I want it to be that there is something called in Rust, uh, in Rust something called ownership, and something called borrowing, something called moving, and also there is a concept of stack and heap. If you get these basic things, I think there were five things that I just named, then you're very, very good uh, fit for the rest of the uh, chapters that actually i want to i want to say that you're you're in a good position to continue with the rest of the chapters that follow in this course and in my opinion uh, ownership in rust at least is best um learned by um, going through it by examples yourself and i know that there is a um there is a book out there uh, available for free uh, and it is uh, called um rust by example and if you go and google that just type rust by example and have a look at ownership examples there's lots of examples and code challenges that you can take to learn more about ownership if you get stuck in them don't get discouraged it's just because you've just gotten started with rust and there could be bumps along the way so if you can't do all the examples that's fine just orient yourself with how rust code is written in terms of ownership and even if you have a look at some code that doesn't work and you even you can't solve it, that's fine too. At least you've seen how that code looks like and that you understand that something is wrong with that code, okay? And uh, throughout this uh, course, we're going to have a look a lot more at different uh, ownership examples uh, in various uh, settings of Rust code. So I hope by the end of those examples that you'll learn a lot more about ownership. So that was all we have for this uh, section of this uh, course. So I hope to see you in the next section.